smaller video, man, just came out, man. I just really just, I ain't just got out. I've been off for, I've been off since like three. Nigga, right now, it's, it's five. Mm -hmm. No, I, no, I got, yeah, I got out, yeah, I got over three. But shit, I, I just been, you know, I don't know. I, I was gonna do like um music videos, but I didn't know what Mr. Baller had posted. So, I mean, not Mr. Baller, but I was gonna do music videos and shit, and you know, so see what they got going on, and shit like that. But you know what I'm saying? We got Mr. Baller, man. Oh, um, it's a, it's a scene. they shot the country, huh? Is it something? Okay, buddy. See what we got going on. Man. <clears throat> In early December of 1985, in the Chattahoochee National Forest in northern Georgia, a hunter was very carefully making his way through the trees, trying to track... Chattahoochee? I think I've been on for... I've been one of them goddamn late. I think it was Chattahoochee. I think it was. Don't get me lying. A deer. Now, this hunter had been tracking this deer for over a mile, but it had been a while since he had seen any signs of it being anywhere nearby. And as this hunter continued to creep along, he became increasingly aware of how loud each of his steps were, because the ground all around him was covered in dry leaves, and so every step he was taking was creating a loud crunching sound. And so eventually, this hunter just came to a stop and decided stalking this deer was totally pointless because he was basically scaring it away with these crunching sounds as he got closer to it. But before this hunter was ready to just give up and head back to his vehicle, he continued on a little bit further, and when he pushed through this particularly dense brush area, he saw this clearing up ahead. And the second he saw what was in this clearing, he froze, took a step back into the brush, and then ducked down behind a rock. Because in that clearing, he saw an animal. And it wasn't a deer. It was a huge American black bear. Now, generally speaking... <laughs> you go Mr. Ball again with these motherfucking bears again. And a black bear. Just like a polar bear. Like what we talked about in the last Mr. Ball video. Black, a black bear is damn near on top of the food chain. Shit, damn near. Huh? American black bears are not aggressive towards humans. However, if, for example, you were to accidentally sneak up on a black bear, like this hunter had done, and you suddenly startled it... I, I take that back. I'm tripping. I'm tripping. I'm tripping. I'm tripping. I'm tripping. Yeah, yeah, when it comes to that, then yeah. Now, a grizzly bear attack you, but a black bear really won't... You can scare... It's easy to scare a black bear. But as long as you, as long as you try to creep up on it or nothing like that, they ain't gonna fuck with you. By just showing your presence, the bear might react by pouncing on you and ripping you to bits. And so this hunter, with his back pressed up against the rock and his rifle gripped tightly across his chest, he's thinking about that and wondering what he's going to do to get out of this situation. At first he thought, okay, I'll just stand up and quietly walk away. But then he remembered how loud the leaves were, and even though he had been lucky walking in, he hadn't alerted the bear to his presence, on the way out, he was worried he wouldn't be so lucky that those leaves would alert the bear to his position. And so the hunter began thinking, okay, well, what if I just stand up and start shooting at this bear? But the hunter knew the big issue with that plan is he had a deer hunting rifle which is not nearly powerful enough to quickly take down a black bear. I got something going. I got something going. Not that motherfucker. Damn. <laughs> For real. Got some bear, if at all. Damn. So if he starts shooting at this bear, there was a very good chance that the bear would just turn around and maul him before he was able to put the bear down with his rifle. And so as this hunter is going through these scenarios behind the rock, he realizes something. He hasn't heard this bear at all. Now, bears in general are very loud animals. Shit. Just their regular breathing is so lateral and noisy that you can hear it a pretty good distance away. And the hunter's thinking to himself, I can't hear it breathing. And come to think of it, I haven't heard this bear once since I've been near it. And so the hunter very carefully stood up from behind his rock and turned around. And then he kind of peered forward into the brush, looking back into this clearing. And when he spotted the bear again, he realized immediately the bear was dead. The bear was kind of slumped forward and its body almost looked like a deflated balloon. The hunter was so relieved, he almost started laughing. And so he stepped out from behind his rock and he made his way through the brush into the clearing. I want to see a motherfucker thing funny. I want to be, I'd be more scared than the bad day. 
What, so what the fuck killed the bell, bitch? <laughs> you don't see no bullets, bitch. What killed the bell? <laughs> what killed the bell? To get a better look at the spare. That's what you need to be looking when at. When the hunter was right over Read. the top of the spare looking down at it, something immediately struck him as very... Uh, Mr. Bowling. The motel ain't kill me with these ass. I'm gonna kill y'all with them, bitch. Very odd. This bear was far too young to have died of natural causes. However, after this hunter kind of poked and prodded the bear and lifted it up on either side to try to look underneath it, he couldn't see any visible injuries. It was like this bear had just randomly dropped dead. But the hunter didn't spend much time thinking about what happened to this bear. Instead, he thought to himself, you know, there has to be some sort of logical explanation for what killed it. And with one last look at the bear on the ground, the hunter turned around and began the long walk back through the woods back to his vehicle. It would turn out there was an explanation for what happened to that bear. However, it was anything but logical. But to get to that non-logical explanation, we first have to go back in time. Around 11.30 p.m. on September 10th, 1985, so three months before the hunter discovered this dead bear, two pilots were flying their little six-seater Cessna airplane over northern Georgia, making their way north towards Tennessee. And as these pilots flew along very casually, they suddenly intercepted over their radio a voice message that they definitely were not supposed to hear. It sounded like other pilots communicating with each other, and what they were talking about was how they were now going to follow this little Cessna airplane that they could see that was currently flying over northern Georgia. Now, radio traffic like this can only really be intercepted if your radio that's doing the intercepting is physically close to the person doing the transmitting. And so knowing this, the two pilots in this little Cessna knew that whoever was talking about following that little Cessna, they had to be talking about them, the two pilots in that Cessna. Now, for most pilots, if you suddenly overheard a radio transmission that your plane was getting followed by some other pilots, you might reach out to those pilots and say, hey, why are you following me? What's going on? Now, the co-pilot of this little Cessna might have wanted to react that way. However, before he could, the main pilot stopped him and said, I actually know exactly why somebody might want to tail us, and unfortunately, we're both going to have to jump out of this plane. Before the co-pilot could really even react to this news, the main pilot had set the Cessna on autopilot, which sets the plane to fly in a straight direction, going at a constant speed, at a constant altitude, until either a pilot comes back and takes the craft back over, or if it just stays on autopilot, it eventually will run out of fuel and crash or run into something. And so after the main pilot had done that, he turned to the co-pilot and gestured for him to come with him into the main cabin of the aircraft, basically the main body of the craft where all their luggage was. And the co-pilot, he's so confused about what's happening, he's so panicked that he just follows the main pilot. So the two of them, they climb back over the two front seats, they go into the main body of the craft, and the main pilot begins strapping parachutes onto some of their luggage. And as he's doing this, he tells the co-pilot to open up the side door of the plane. And so again, the co-pilot is just so caught off guard, he has no idea how to handle this, and so he reaches over and he slides open this door of this moving plane. And as soon as he did, this huge rush of cold night air blasted inside of the cabin and it became so loud from the howling wind coming in that the two pilots couldn't even talk to each other. And then the main pilot just began pushing the luggage out of the plane just into the night, falling straight down to the ground far, far below them. And at some point, the co-pilot just joined him and began pushing the luggage out of the plane. And then after all the luggage was out, the main pilot shoved a parachute into the hands of the co-pilot and said, you know, put it on. He had to gesture for it because they couldn't hear each other. And so as this co-pilot's struggling to get on his parachute, the main pilot puts on his chute. And then right after the co-pilot has just barely got his parachute on, the main pilot pushes him out the side of the plane. And then the main pilot jumps out after him. So they basically abandoned their plane, which was still set to autopilot. So at some point, it was just going to crash. About five hours Hours later, in a suburb of Knoxville, Tennessee, an 85-year-old man named Fred Myers was just waking up. 
Fred always got up before sunrise. It was part of his daily routine. He would wake up, he would get dressed, he would wash and shave his face, and then he would sit down and read the local newspaper. This simple routine was actually very important to Fred because recently he had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, which is a progressive disease that destroys memory. And so having this sort of set routine helped him manage his symptoms. Basically, at least in the morning, he could go into autopilot and go through this routine and not get confused. However, on this particular morning, something would happen that would leave Fred more confused than he had ever been in his entire life. Fred had made it to his bathroom, he had washed his face, and he had begun shaving when out of the corner of his eye, he noticed something strange outside in his driveway. He could see it through a nearby window, but it was still so dark outside, Fred couldn't tell what this thing was out there. And so feeling very curious, Fred put his razor blade down and he made his way over to the window to get a better look. And when he reached the window and looked out at his driveway and saw what this strange thing was, he could not believe his eyes. God damn, Mr. Baldwin. It's not enough to just reinvent transportation. You gotta be able to bring everybody. There was this huge parachute out on his driveway. And on the parachute was the main pilot of the Cessna. After the main pilot had pushed the co-pilot out and leapt out himself, when he pulled his ripcord, his chute either didn't deploy or when it deployed, it didn't inflate fully. And so he was forced to go to his reserve chute, but it didn't inflate fast enough to stop him from crashing into the ground. And so the main pilot slammed into the ground, basically at terminal velocity. And so he sustained catastrophic internal injuries and he died within a couple of minutes of hitting the ground. Fred was so stunned and confused at what he was looking at that without saying a word, he just turned away from his window and walked over to his phone and called the police, shaving cream still on his face. When the police arrived at Fred's house that morning, they were expecting to see a dead recreational skydiver on Fred's property. But when they walked up the driveway and saw the dead man for themselves, they knew right away this was not some recreational skydiver. He actually looked more like a soldier. He was wearing a bulletproof vest over some camouflage fatigues, and he had night vision goggles strapped to his head. But the dead man's shoe choice made the police think this guy could not possibly have been military because on this guy's feet were not military-style combat boots like you would expect with the rest of his getup. Instead, he was wearing loafers, specifically Gucci loafers, so very expensive designer shoes. And so the police are thinking to themselves, who the heck was this guy and what was he doing? The police would figure that out. However, first, we have to fast forward two months to God late man. November 1985, so roughly two weeks before that bear was discovered by that hunter in Chattahoochee National Forest. Now, at this point in late November, that black bear was alive and well and living a typical black bear life in the Chattahoochee National Forest, which meant he mostly spent his time wandering around the woods looking for something to eat. And on this particular day in November, the bear was doing just that when out of the corner of his eye, he spotted something strange lying on the forest floor. It was one of the pieces of luggage that the two pilots had pushed out of their plane. It was this big, heavy duffel bag. Now, the bear had no idea if this duffel bag contained food, but the bear was optimistic, so it meandered its way over and began to oh pawing at the, the bag, bag with its massive claws, and pretty much immediately, his claws tore open a hole in this bag. And suddenly, the air all around this bear was filled with this glorious, flowery smell. So the bear put its nose directly into this rip in the bag and began sniffing and licking the contents of this bag. And apparently, the bear just loved it because it ate whatever was inside of the bag. All of it. And when he was done, the bear felt so good, he was so full of energy, that he just started sprinting in a straight direction. And after running at top speed about a hundred yards, every major goddamn bell cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just bullshit because I see the trailers tell us some cocaine bears some shit like that. <laughs> system inside of this bear shut down all at once and he died on the spot, collapsing in that clearing. 
And then, about two weeks later, that hunter walked into the Chattahoochee National Forest and discovered this dead bear. And then, within 24 hours, the hunter was back home, and he told one of his friends about discovering this dead bear. And when he told his friend about seeing this bear, he also kind of casually mentioned that he had seen a duffel bag in the forest not far from this dead bear. Now, to understand what this friend did next, you need some context. By this point in time, the police had actually figured out a lot about that dead man on Fred Myers' driveway, the main pilot of the Cessna. They knew he was a 40-year-old man named Andrew Thornton, who had served in the U.S. Army as a paratrooper, but after getting out of the service, he had kind of gone astray in his life and become a big-time smuggler of illegal goods. The police had also figured out by this point that Andrew, along with a co-pilot, had been the people flying that Cessna that eventually was found crashed into a mountainside in North Carolina. The co-pilot had survived the jump out of the Cessna, and so the police tracked him down, and they very quickly realized this co-pilot was really just a victim of Andrew. Andrew had told this guy they were just going to fly to the Bahamas for a vacation. And so when that plan completely evaporated, and suddenly Andrew is barking orders at this guy to open up the plane and push the luggage out and jump out, the co-pilot said he just totally panicked and just started doing whatever Andrew wanted. And so this guy was just totally terrified, and really all he could offer police was just to confirm that, yep, Andrew was the main pilot, and yes, we really did push his luggage out of the side of the plane over some forest in northern Georgia. The police believed the co-pilot and did not charge him with any crime. The police would go ahead and search all over northern Georgia, and they would find the majority of the missing bags. However, they knew they were still missing some, and they knew they really needed to recover them. And so, around the time that this hunter is telling his friend about this bear encounter and this duffel bag, the police were constantly having news outlets tell people in northern Georgia that if you see one of these duffel bags attached to a big parachute or something, please come forward and tell us. We are looking for these. And so the hunter's friend thought, you know what, that duffel bag he mentioned out in Chattahoochee National Forest, which is in northern Georgia, might be one of those bags. And so the friend called authorities. Authorities were thrilled to get this tip, and so they charged out to the Chattahoochee National Forest, and they made their way out to where this dead bear was, and then sure enough, about 100 yards away from this bear was this bag, and it was one of the bags they were missing. Except the bag was empty, because, as we already know, that black bear had eaten everything inside of this bag. And as you might have guessed, that bag, along with every other bag that had been cast out of the Cessna that night, was full of cocaine. Because Andrew what was a drug smuggler. And on the night, he Wait. and his co-pilot left. I don't know about that part, but I said that motherfucker had more cocaine. I, I was joking, though. I was joking. I didn't know that motherfucker actually had cocaine in it. Nigga. <laughs> And they actually got a movie coming out about that shit, though. Uh, cocaine, cocaine, bear, some shit, bear, cocaine. Bro, bro, look it up, bro. It's called Cocaine Bear or some shit. It's supposed to be a funny movie. Damn. I, I kind of I picture that, though. I ain't gonna lie to you. When he was like, somebody following him type of shit. Yeah, I'm, uh, I... From the Cessna, he was trying to smuggle 900 pounds of cocaine Damn. from South America into the United States. That transmission that Andrew and the co-pilot suddenly overheard on their radio as they were cruising along in their Cessna was the sound of federal agents within the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency who had been tipped off about Andrew's big drug run, and so they really had sent two planes to go follow him and potentially intercept him. And so the authorities standing in the Chattahoochee National Forest looking down at this empty duffel bag had no idea where the cocaine went that was supposed to be inside of it. But on a hunch, they decided to bring the body of the dead black bear back with them and perform an autopsy on it. And sure enough, during this autopsy, the medical examiner would open up the bear's stomach and the examiner would say the stomach was, quote, packed to the brim with cocaine thus ending the mystery of how this bear died. It died from a massive, cocaine massive cocaine overdose. But the bear story did not end there. Oh, Normally, after an animal is autopsied, they are cremated. 
But for some reason, this medical examiner decided not to do that, and instead, he had the bear taxidermied, and then he gifted this taxidermied bear to the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. And then from there, the bear changed hands many times. Over the next two decades, no one knows exactly who had the bear and for what reason, but there were reports that at least at one point it was stolen from a storage facility, and then it was sold at a pawn shop, and then at some point the bear was in the possession of famous country singer Waylon Jennings, and then finally, the bear found its forever home. Today, the bear is on display at the Kentucky Fun Mall in Lexington, Kentucky, and around its neck is a placard that reads, Cocaine Bear. So, that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to make the like button a ham and cheese sandwich, but... I can't tell you how dumb I feel right now. I... I... I know it went true because I just seen the trailer like last night. And this shit said cocaine bear. That bear running crazy to the motherfucker. <laughs> Damn, I ain't know that. That's the name of the movie, but let me. I mean, not, they, they, they confirmed it, but. Cocaine. Bear. Cocaine bear. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Hey, this morning in Knoxville, Tennessee. There's more of this out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this shit. Oh, so this the movie based off of that. Oh, yeah, that shit for real. Okay, that, that's what that was. Oh, yeah, so the movie based off of that. It called Cocaine Bear. Anyway, damn, that was a crazy ass story. <laughs> that being said, man, give me a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. See y'all motherfuckers on that video. Hit the video, hit the thumbs up, and hit the notification bell. That notification when I post another video. Let's ride, nigga.